I want to thank all the family and friends that came to be a part of this today. And this is, this is a really wonderful day, a day that we'll remember. And thank you for being a part of that. It's good to see other people that I haven't seen in a while. It's good to see some more college students. It's good to see some other folks. And I am so glad that you are here. And uh, I'm just praying that you will sense God's presence um, in your life today. If you're here today and you haven't been for the first couple weeks, we're doing a little different thing. We're doing a, a sermon series on the tabernacle. And you go, what on earth is that? Well, it's an admittedly obscure part of history, and I get that. But I think it was important enough that it was featured in the New Testament in some explanation. And I think there's lessons that were learned then that can still be learned today. And one of those Ryan mentioned in his sermon last week, and that was a wonderful sermon. I thank Ryan um, for preaching that sermon, and uh, it helps set up this week. So this scripture this week, let me tell you, is pretty boring. And I know it's boring, but I just want you to hide, I want to highlight just how specific and purposeful every part of the detail was in building the tabernacle, and I'll move on from there. There's nothing life-changing in this. If they ask you at the restaurant, and by the way, I hope you beat the Baptist to the restaurant, um, if, if they ask you what was your sermon on and you give the scripture, they're going to look at you and, and, and go cross-eyed and say, that was your scripture? And you, Yes. And you'd have to explain it. But it's in Exodus 26, and it's just a couple verses. And I, once I, I read it, I'll kind of explain why I used it. I could have used about ten others. And it's talking about the curtains that they use to make the tabernacle. And it says, make curtains of goat hair for the tent over the tabernacle, 11 together. All 11 curtains are to be the same size, 30 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together into one set and the other six into another set. Fold the six curtain double at the front of the tent and make 50 loops along the edge of the end curtain in one set and also along the edge of the end curtain in the other set. Isn't this thrilling reading? Then make the 50 bronze clasps and put them in the loops to fasten the tent together as a unit. And as for the additional length of the ten curtains, the half curtain is left over is to hang down at the rear of the tabernacle. Whew, your eyes glazed over? Mine are just reading it. I just want to read it because this, was, this tabernacle was planned with great detail. In previous weeks, we talked about how the tabernacle went wherever Israel went. If you would have stumbled upon the community, you'd come up over a hill and you'd just seen a sea of tents. And in the middle of the community of tents would have been a rectangle, very visible, with no tents in the rectangle. And around the rectangle would have been that curtain that I just described. That's a, that's a lot. It was to mark out specifically where God was. And if you wanted to go where God was when the ancient Israelites, you had to go to the center of the camp. It was purposeful. You needed to prepare for it. You needed to know what direction to go. I remember about, I think this would have been 1990. I was living in Kansas at the time. And I was in charge of this program for the district, which was about 80-some churches. And if the teens did a certain amount of stuff, service projects and, and stuff through the year, they got to go on a summer mission project. And I was put in charge of the summer mission project. Oh, joy. And so I thought, where am I going to take a bunch of kids from the plains of Kansas and I said, I know exactly where we'll go. We went to Lincoln Park Community Church of the Nazarene in downtown Chicago. And so I took a bunch of kids that are used to their neighbors being two miles down the road into the middle of the city. And one night after we had worked, the plan was we were going to go to Oak Street Beach and have a cookout on the beach. And so we were there and we were going we're in our vans going down to Oak Street Beach, and we weren't there yet, and a kid come up, and he knelt next to my seat in the van, and he said, hey, can I ask a question? And I said, of course you can ask a question. And I said, what is it? He said, 
when we get done with the cookout, I said, yes, can we get back in the van and go see the other Great Lakes? And I said, no. And he said, why? I said, because it's a day's drive to the next one. And he said, no, it's not. On the map at school, they're all right there together. He didn't know the size and the direction that you had to go. He didn't get that the lake he was looking at was as big as half the state he just left. If you wanted to go meet God in the ancient Israelite camp, you had to go to the center. And you know what? In order for us to go where God meets us, we have to journey to our interior world, to the center of ourselves. We live in a time and a place and a culture where most people avoid the interior world. We're always plugged in somewhere. There's something always going and it always changes. Remember about 15 years ago, the first time you were at Jewel and you met that crazy lunatic that was pacing up and down the potato chip aisle having this very intense conversation? And then that's when Bluetooth or whatever first came out. Then you had the little iPod clip on your belt and you had the wires up and people were always listening to something. And now you notice and see everything, this is, you know, I came of age when the Walkman was cool. And now there's no wires. They just have these little things in their ears and somehow the sound gets up there. I mean, I understand the technology, but, you know, I'm getting old. The thing about our interior world is we must make intentional time and intentional effort to engage ourselves. Here's the problem it's often really, really difficult to engage our interior world. Sometimes it's an unpleasant conversation. The reason why we avoid our interior is because we don't like the voice that greets us at the other end. And that's why so many people avoid it. And I think the reason why we live in a world where the exterior is such a mess is because our interior is such a mess. And what is in the interior will always get out. Our old house, the one we lived in for 23 years, as some of you remember the stories, the worst thing that could happen is, is we would be at home and hear that we were predicted to get some kind of massive rain of like six or seven or eight inches because that started what it's known as the sleepless nights, where we're downstairs with a wet vac, just waiting for something from the other side to find its way through a crack and start to get into our basement. That happened about four or five times in 23 years. Because what's on the other side will always find a crack. And the reason why we have so much problem with our exterior world is because we have a problem with our interior world. Not only did you have to go to the center, but you kind of had to do it alone. See, you went alone. The tabernacle was separated from the rest of the camp. You had this big rectangle, and then you, you couldn't just like pick up the tent flap. No, no, you had to go to the entrance, and you had to walk across the courtyard, and you had to go past some very important things that marked out the space and go to this little square tent in the middle of the camp, which is where the priests went to once a year to make a sacrifice to God. So there are curtains that mark the tabernacle as sacred, that, these curtains I just described. My point is simply this. One could not just accidentally wander into the area. In 1984, I was in college, and I was down in Bourbonnais, and a couple of us went up to the College of DuPage, which is in Glen Ellen. And the reason why we went up is there was a big political rally. And I, I was 19 at the time. And the reason why is I'd never seen a president. President Reagan was having a rally at the, at, 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 at the College of DuPage. I'd never seen a president in person. So about three of us went. And we went and heard the rally. And then we left. And the College of DuPage is like 18 buildings or something. 
And I knew we were parked way over there. And how we got there was long. And I said, you know what? There's this little gap between buildings. I bet if we went through here, I bet that's a shortcut back to where the parking lot was. And so we squeezed between these two buildings. And there was like a little dead-end alley on the other side. And there was this big van. And the back door of the van was open. And we turned around. And so help me, a different day and age, this van was full of hand grenades, machine guns, and a bunch of other things. And I think one of us went, wow, look at that. And about the time we said, wow, about three Secret Service agents quickly emerged <laughs> and said, move along, gentlemen. And we went, okay, yeah, but you said, move along, gentlemen, quickly. And so we did. I don't think in 2022 it's, it's near as easy to accidentally wander into the back of the Secret Service van as it was in 1984. You also couldn't just accidentally wander into the tabernacle. You had to go purposefully. You probably went with a lamb or a dove or another animal to sacrifice um, and the first thing you encountered was the altar that was there for your offering. It was needed because that was how you atoned for your shortcomings. And there was always a fire on the altar. What do you mean, always a fire? I thought it was for my shortcomings. Why is the fire always... Oh, I get it. My shortcomings are always with me. I need to live with this awareness that maybe I'm not quite as good as I think I am. An awareness of my own sin. The other thing is that uh, I think one of the important thing is we all have to get to the spot, and I would love to broadcast this to culture if I could. We all have to get to the spot where we all become aware that my problem is me. My problem is not my boss. My problem is not mom and dad. They didn't throw me a birthday party when I was 13, and I'm oppressed, and now I'm going to let it affect me the rest of my life. You're not oppressed. It's not, your life's not messed up because everything didn't go perfect. The fault, the thing that causes, the person that causes me the most problems has always been me. The person that needs to atone for my sin is always me. One could not just tag along with a bunch of friends and go, oh yeah, his goat, yeah, count that in. Yeah, yeah, I'm with that. Just, yeah, just use that for me. The priest would went, no, that's not how that works. I remember the words of David on the altar of the threshing floor when he said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God that which cost me nothing. Oh, one last thing. I'm talking to the men here. <laughs> So ladies, you can check out for about 45 seconds. In that time, in that place, and I think there's part of this that I still want to hold on to a little bit. The men of the family went to the priest in behalf of their family. They stood in behalf of their family. We have lost this sense of accountability in our culture. Men, it's more than our job just... First of all, I want culture, it's more than our job to, to love our children. It's also our job to love our children's mother for a lifetime. It's also our job to pray for our family. It's also our job to stand in the gap. It's also our job to plead the case. It's also our job to soak up every pain in behalf of them. And when good things happen, to let the mirror shine on the people in our household. We need to gain a little bit of that back. One of the first things you got to in the tabernacle was this bronze basin where the priests would clean themselves before they would go in and offer a sacrifice in behalf of the people. And one of the things you would do, you'd bend over and the, th the person that was looking back at you was always you. I think we always need to have a pretty clear head about our own self. Realize our own shortcomings. Be ready to own up to them. And realize that altar that's there that's always on fire is a reminder that our bad choices, our shortcomings, our sin often has deadly consequences. 
And as we were in that, and we'd look at that little center tent that was square where the Ark of the Covenant was, the Holy of Holies, where the priest would go once a year to make atonement. And we'll talk about the Ark next week. Only the priest could enter. And it was absolutely required that the high priest have no sin. A thoughtless approach, even of the high priest, had deadly consequences for the high priest. We go in the Old Testament, no one could touch the ark. There was one story where it happened. It steadied and someone reached out and touched the ark. And it, the Old Testament story in Joshua is that person died. And you go, oh, that's terrible. But I think there was trying to be a message that was communicated. And the communication was, I am God and I'm not you. This is not quite the same, but it's pretty close. There was once when my son was about 14, and he came bounding in the house with two of his friends, Matt and Brogan. They're still friends today. And you know how when you're 14 and 15 and you're a boy, you kind of get full of yourself pretty quickly? I don't know exactly what. Michelle and I were sitting in the living room, and they came in the front door, and Adam, in front of his two friends, looked at us and said, Hey, Doug, hey, Michelle, how you doing? The next minute did not go well for Adam. And it didn't go well in front of his friends. And the one thing I said is, Don't you think for a second that you're at the level of your mom and dad and that you can just thoughtlessly, carelessly approach us that way? You can call us mom and dad. You got it? Yes, sorry. I think sometimes we can be guilty of treating God a little bit like a full of himself teenager can treat mom and dad. A realization that God is God and we are not. And it's important to remember Last, when you went to meet God in this age, you had to be purposeful about it. You had to be purposeful and intentional with wanting to meet God. There have been times in our history where maybe we've presented an angry God, a vengeful God, a God that's waiting to get you. Some of you remember Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God in the 1700s. Maybe there's been a time, and maybe when you were young, some of you grew up in a time and a place where maybe the pendulum was way too far over here. God was angry. God was stern. God was going to get you. Perhaps the pendulum was too far. If you make God so unapproachable, then why even try? And what often happened is people would hide and secretly live a double life. Can I suggest that that was maybe too far? And may I also add that maybe and culturally we've swung too far in the other direction now. That God is so loving, so forgiving, which he is. Oh, don't worry about it. I know it's wrong. I'm going to do it anyway because God will forgive me. That's a dangerous attitude to go through life. Listen to some of the things Jesus said. Remember him, the nice guy? The affirming, therapeutic, hugger, affirmer. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many will find it. But narrow is the road that leads to life, and few will find it. Another place. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Another place in Matthew, if any man follow me, he must deny himself, pick up a cross, and follow me. Again in Matthew chapter 5, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. James, faith without works is dead. Another place in the Gospels, not everyone who says Lord on that day will be saved. Well, then who will? Well, when you saw the hungry, did you feed them? When you saw the naked person, did you clothe them? Found the one in prison, did you visit? 
I think we need to remember that going to God is intentional. Michelle and I have been doing something in the last couple years that we haven't done in a while. When grandkids are at our house, um, frequently, especially before bedtime, and I know I've heard my wife sing it, and it's a very pleasant thing for me to hear, and I know that she's heard me sing it at times, our grandkids, when they go to, and one night Mabel got up about three in the morning, Mabel got up at three in the morning because apparently monsters were trying to get to the room and get her, and she came into our room and she said, Grandma, monsters are trying to get me. Well, it was 3.15 in the morning, and Grandma said, did you hear that, Grandpa? Monsters are trying to get her. So I went to her room with my pillow, and I slept on the floor. And I said, Mabel, I'll sleep on the floor here, okay? Monsters won't come in if I'm in here. So, But before I do, I prayed with her, and like I've done, and my wife has done even more. You know what? <clears throat> we sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And then the chorus and the kids calm down. And that's what we've done. See, I want to have a house where music is heard. When I was a parent, when I was a, now it is, I'm a grandparent, I want those words to be heard and that's important. I want everybody here to know that very simple message that God loves us. But I also want everyone to know that the cost for our redemption was high. And we don't accidentally just wander into it. And we live in a world where people, I just noticed this week, people don't give much thought to their week other than to bounce from crisis to crisis, without giving intentional thought to what comes next. And to remind us all that we come to Christ intentionally and with purpose. And that's a quality that God was teaching His people in the tabernacle. You do not just accidentally wander into me. It took purpose and intention and a will and I think those are qualities that in many ways we've lost today. And we don't even know where we're going. We just kind of just careen through life, bouncing off the things that happen. I've told this story before, so I apologize, but not everybody has heard it. This would have been um, back again about 30 years ago. Different group of kids... We were in the desert of Arizona. We spent a week working at an Indian reservation. But on the way there, we stopped in northern New Mexico to go whitewater rafting in the Rio Grande Gorge. That's about 1,500 feet sheer canyon down to the bottom. And we were split up into about six or seven different rafts. And I was in the raft with all the kamikaze teenage guys. And we came around a bend in the river, and in front of us in the middle of the river was like a minivan-sized boulder. And the guide behind me went, oh. And I turned around and go, oh, what do you mean, oh? And he says, you see that boulder? And I said, yeah. He said, that wasn't here yesterday. So I've been looking down the whole time at the river. Now i got to look up. And he says, let's just stop here for a second. And we got in a little eddy, and he said, all right, I think I got it. I think we can go left of the boulder, and I think we're fine to go right of the boulder. And then he says, or we can just hit the boulder and see what happens. Now, I'm in the raft with all the teenage guys, and you know what they voted. And so we went careening in the boulder. We spun off of it, bounced. They were screaming and laughing, having a great time. We made it through fine. Now, someone, another group on another trip did a similar thing and didn't bounce off the boulder. They kind of went up the side of the boulder and then over. 
Then we're pulling people in from the water. Now, why did I tell the story? Because I think we serve one. We serve one who sometimes wants us to be very intentional of how we live. And sometimes, because we get a little ahead of ourselves, we say, I got a better idea. I'll just ram into things and just see what happens with life. And sometimes we'll make it through, and other times we'll just go right up the side of the boulder and tip over. And in those cases, I have another assurance. We serve one who's been down the river before. And actually the one who made the river. And is able to get us back in the raft and point in the right direction and live intentionally again. Let's have our worship team come up.